Hi, and welcome to AP Chemistry Review. It's me, Dr. V, and I'm here to help you get ready for that AP Chemistry exam in May. In this webcast, we're working on the second free response question from the 2019 exam. This is a long free response question. It was scored out of 10 points. And all long free response questions are these kitchen sink kinds of questions where there's multiple topics and you're jumping from one subtopic to another with very little warning. Um, and so you really need to be ready for that. What's the best way to get ready for that? Do the problem on your own before you listen to my solution. Okay, get your calculator, get your periodic table, get your formula sheet, try to work through the whole problem before you listen to my explanation. You can do one part at a time, or you can work through the whole thing and then listen to my webcast. If you work through the whole question, the College Board says a long free response question should be about 23 minutes of working time. If you want to break that up because that makes more sense for you, that's fine. But do try to work through it before you listen to my solution and then keep track of your score as you go. And that will help you get a feel for whether or not you're showing enough work to support your answer and earn the points and demonstrate your knowledge or whether you need to enhance that a little bit. So let's jump right in. Question number two was all about the chemistry of the halogens. We start with the molecular formulas of the diatomic halogen molecules, bromine, chlorine, fluorine, and iodine. And the question says, circle the formula of the molecule that has the longest bond length and justify your choice in terms of atomic structure. So, longest bond length, all right? We're talking about the distance between the nuclei in the molecules. Okay, so they're all halogens. They're all in the same family. And the answer is that it's iodine. This was scored out of one point, but just the circle iodine is not going to get you that point. If you don't have a justification that's correct and logical, you're not going to earn that point. It's all or nothing here. So these halogens, we know as we go down the column that we're adding more energy levels for the electrons to occupy. You're adding more shells, right? And these energy levels are farther from the nucleus. So as we go from fluorine to chlorine to bromine to iodine, we've got more energy levels. They're farther from the nucleus. That means an iodine atom is going to have the largest radius of these four elements. So it follows if we put them together to make diatomic molecules, the atoms with the largest radius are going to form molecules with the largest distance between the nuclei. And therefore iodine molecules have the longest bond length of the four. So your answer really needs to focus on those additional energy levels or additional shells as you go down the column supporting your answer. That's really what you need to have here. All right, let's go on to part B. A chemistry teacher wants to prepare bromine, and the teacher has access to sodium bromide in solution, chlorine gas, ooh, and solid iodine. Okay, and then we've got this table of half reactions. I'm noticing they're all reduction half reactions and e naught values. Okay, so part B says, using the data here, write the balanced equation for the thermodynamically favorable reaction that will produce bromine by reacting two out of the three reagents that we have. And then justify the reaction as thermodynamically favorable by calculating the value of E naught. So there are two things that we need to do to, for this question. And it was scored, not surprisingly, out of two points, okay? So we need bromine to be a product. If I look at my half reactions, my half in reaction involving bromine has bromine Br2 as a reactant. I need it as a product. So what I need to do is flip this reaction. And when we flip the reaction, the sign of E naught changes. So we're going to go ahead and do that. All right, I need to reverse the equation and change the sign of E naught. So that's what I need to happen in terms of the bromine half reaction. Now what I need to do is figure out Okay, do I want to react the bromine, the bromide ions with chlorine or iodine in order to get this reaction to occur? And I need a reaction that's thermodynamically favorable. And that means when I add the two half reactions that I choose together, I need an E cell for the overall reaction that's greater than zero. So I've got the chlorine half reaction with an E naught of 1.36, and I've got the iodine half reaction with an E naught of 0.53. Now, because I flipped that bromine half reaction that I've highlighted in blue, right, the flipped reaction has an E naught of negative 
So I, the question really becomes, okay, of the other two, when I add them together, which one's going to give me a number greater than zero? All right, chlorine with its E naught of 1.36, um, if I add that to negative 1.07, I get a number greater than zero. So chlorine is the choice. If I try to do it with the iodine half reaction, I get an E cell that is less than zero. That's not going to work. That's not thermodynamically favorable. So I'm going with the chlorine half reaction. I'm going to write it down. I'm going to write it with my arrows aligned because that makes my life a lot easier. And I'm going to just copy down its E naught value. All right, but I'm still not done. I'm almost there. What I need now is to write the balanced equation, all right, which needs to have conservation of mass and charge. And I'm looking at the two half reactions, all right, and they both have two electrons. So the number of electrons on both sides is the same. So the same number of electrons are lost and gained. So I'm going to add those up and that'll give me my overall balanced equation. And all right, so chlorine plus two bromides give me chloride ions and bromine. And then I'm going to add up my E naught values. And I see that I have an E naught for the reaction of plus 0.29 volts, which is greater than zero. And therefore this is correct. So it was one point for the overall balanced equation, one point for the E cell or the um, E naught value for the reaction. Okay, bromine and chlorine can react to form a compound bromine monochloride. The boiling point of diatomic bromine is 332 Kelvin. Okay. The boiling point of bromine monochloride, the compound, is 278 Kelvin. Okay. The question says, explain this difference in boiling point in terms of all the intermolecular forces present between molecules of each substance. All right. So this question was also scored out of two points, and they want very, very particular information in your answer. All right. So Elemental bromine, Br2, is a nonpolar molecule. Both atoms have the same electronegativity. They're sharing their electrons equally in that bond. All right, it's nonpolar. Well, nonpolar species, in terms of their intermolecular forces, can only do one thing. They can participate in London forces, right? So London forces are all about the polarizability of the electron cloud. We, it can get temporarily distorted and induce attractions to other species. And if you don't know your intermolecular forces. I've got a whole webcast on that. You should go listen to it. All right. So bromine can do London forces, and that's really what you needed to say about bromine. In terms of bromine monochloride, it's a polar molecule, all right? Bromine and chlorine atoms would have different electronegativity values, and therefore it's a polar molecule. Because it's a polar molecule, it can do more than bromine. It can do London forces. All matter can do London forces. And we can also bring dipole-dipole attractions. All right. Can be involved here. So we still haven't explained the difference in the boiling points though. Okay. Bromine's boiling point is higher than that of bromine monochloride. We are told that in the question and that is really important. All right. Here's what it means. If you've got a higher boiling point, your intermolecular forces are stronger. That's what you have to remember. And therefore, bromine uh, has a higher boiling point because its London forces must be stronger than the combined strength of the London forces and dipole-dipole attractions for BRCL. You know, a lot of times we think, oh, dipole-dipole attractions are stronger than London forces. And that's sort of a general pattern. But we have specific boiling point information here. And the College Board loves to ask this question where it's discrepant like that, all right? Whatever species has the higher boiling point has the stronger intermolecular attractions, all right? So the London forces of bromine are stronger collectively than the intermolecular forces that BRCL can participate in. And your answer needs to reflect that, all right? So it was one point really for saying what the intermolecular forces were in each species and the other point for saying why bromine's boiling point is higher. All right, let's go on. The compound bromine monochloride can decompose into its elements. Here's the balanced equation. We have a delta H value for the overall reaction. A 0.100 mole sample of bromine monochloride gas is placed in a previously evacuated rigid 2.00 liter container at 298 Kelvin. All right, so the volume of the container is fixed. It didn't have anything else in it. All right, and eventually the system reaches equilibrium. All right, calculate the pressure in the container before equilibrium is established. In other words, 
based on just the moles of BrCl, what was the pressure in the container? This question was scored out of one point. Let's think about what we know. We know moles of BrCl, we know a volume, we know a temperature. This is an ideal gas law calculation, right? So PV equals nRT. We can re rearrange this equation to isolate P, substitute everything in. We need to choose a value for the universal gas constant R that works with, you know, gas pressures. The one on your formula sheet uses atmospheres. So we're going to just substitute that in, all right? So we rearrange the equation, we substitute in everything we know, all right? And that's going to give us a pressure in atmospheres of 1.22 atmospheres. All right, sounds good. Let's go on. All right, part E says, okay, write the expression for the equilibrium constant for the decomposition of BRCL. This was also scored out of one point. All right, so a really easy point here, I think. All right, you just have to remember how to write KEQ expressions. It's products over reactants. The coefficients from the balanced equation become exponents in the equilibrium constant expression. So we plug that in. So if you want to write it in terms of concentrations, molarities, you use square brackets. All right, so bromine uh, and chlorine, the elements are the re products. Their coefficients are one, so their exponents are one. BRCL is the reactant. Its coefficient is 2, and so it gets squared in the Kc expression. It's Kc because it's based on concentrations. All right. You could have written a Kp expression based on gas pressures. That would have also gotten full credit. You only needed one of these, right? But it did have to have the correct form. Products over reactants, coefficients become exponents, and off you go. All right. Let's go on to the next part of the question. All right. Um, back to the idea of equilibrium. We're told that eventually the system reaches equilibrium according to this equation. After the system has reached equilibrium, 42% of the original BRCL sample has decomposed. And we're asked here to calculate the value of KEQ. So my recommendation here for this question, which was scored out of two points, is to set up an ice table. That's really always a good strategy with these kinds of problems, okay? So initially, here's what we know. We know the BRCL pressure, we solved for that a couple of parts back, 1.22 atmospheres. But when the system is initially set up, we're assuming we didn't have any bromine gas. We didn't have any chlorine gas. So we've got all reactants. In order for this system to establish equilibrium, I need to use up some of my reactants and make products. The system is going to proceed in the forward direction, All right? So the concentration of BRCL or the pressure of BRCL has to drop since its coefficient is two, it's gonna drop by two X. The pressure of bromine is gonna go up by X. The pressure of chlorine is going to go up by X because their coefficients are one and I have to make them, okay? So before I can finish the table though, I need to figure out uh, how much of the BRCL has reacted. We were told that 42% of the original BRCL sample decomposed when, once equilibrium was established. So we need to calculate what that is, okay? So what I need to do is take 42% of 1.22 atmospheres. I get um, 0.51, all right? But if we think about the way our ice table is set up, that's actually equal to 2x. So that tells us how much the BRCL drops, all right? But we need to know how much Br2 and Cl2 we make, all right? And so we had to find just the value of x. All right, so that would be 0.26. So they basically gave us X to set up the ice table. All right, so now that we know what X is and we know what 2X is, we can actually put those numbers in terms of the equilibrium concentrations or pressures, actually in this case, right into our table. All right, so I have to use up 0.51 atmospheres. I'm sorry, yeah, 0.51 atmospheres of the BRCL, which leaves me at 0.71 at equilibrium, and I have to make 0.26 atmospheres of bromine and 0.26 atmospheres of chlorine. Now that I have the table all filled out, I can substitute this into my KEQ expression. I'm choosing the KPs because I did pressures, okay, in my ice table because I had a pressure of BRCL, and so I'm going to substitute my equilibrium pressures in and do the math. I get a KP of 0.13, and uh, I know everything to two sig figs because I had 42% and equilibrium constants are presented as dimensionless ratios. 
My other comment is that you could have done this con this whole ice table based on molarities. I had 0.100 moles in a two liter con uh, container. So I'd have, I could have found the initial molarity of BRCL and done a similar approach. My numbers would have been a little bit different, but in the end, my KC value actually works out to be the same number, All right? So whether I solve for KP or KC in this problem, doesn't matter. All right, I th there's a little bit more to do. The, uh, we're told now, we're given this new table uh, of bonds and the bond energy, the energy it takes to break a bond. Um, it says calculate the bond energy of the BRCL bond using delta H for the reaction, which we're told, again, is 1.6 kilojoules per mole, and the table. All right, so to do this problem, right, um, we're using the idea that the sum of the bond energies of what's broken minus the sum of the bond energies of what's formed gives us delta H. And this was scored out of one point. So what we need to do is figure out what bonds we broke and what bonds we have to make. All right, so if we look at the reactants, right, we have to break bonds in the reactants, and that would be a BRCL bond. But there are two molecules of BRCL in the balance equation here. So I have to break two BRCL bonds, okay? And then I have um, to make a Br2 bond, right? Just one of them. And then I have to make a Cl2 bond, all right? Again, just one of them, all right? So if you think about what I know, I know delta H overall. I know the enthalpy of the um, bonds formed. What I don't know is the enthalpy of BrCl. And I do have two of those. So now we can actually substitute that in, all right? So delta H of reaction is 1.6 kilojoules per mole. The enthalpy of the bonds broken, there's two BRCL bonds, so there's two of them, all right? Minus the values for the bromine and chlorine uh, bond enthalpies, all right? Um, so I'm going to just solve for X at this point. It's just an algebra problem. So the key really to solving this problem successfully is sum of what's broken minus the sum of what's formed. I always remember it because they're alphabetical. That's really how I do it. Um, and then I just solve for X, right? And I just consolidate, rearrange, and I get a value of 219 kilojoules per mole for the enthalpy of breaking a BRCL bond. That's how much energy I have to put into the bond to break it. Okay. So how did you do? All right. The average score on this question in 2019 was 4.07 points out of 10. All right, so most students got 40%. If you got 40%, you're doing just fine. If you got 50% or more, if you got five points or more on this question, then you are doing quite well, and you should be really pleased with yourself. If you didn't get all the points you wanted, go back and think about how you needed to enhance your answers to make them stronger, to make them better show what you know, to make them more accurate. That's what you're aiming for here. And if you haven't already subscribed to my channel, I'd really appreciate it if you did that right now. Thank you. Have a good day.